Okay, we'll just uh, pass it God's blessing. Lord, thank you for this new day. Thank you for this time where we can come together in fellowship, but also to hear the word that you have for us. We pray that it uh, meets not just in our heads, but our, but our hearts, and that we can learn something that can be edifying and that can help us in our Christian walk. We pray in Jesus' name. Okay, so I suppose if there's a theme scripture to this, uh, Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1, I'll just read that. It says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Okay, so we're just going to emphasize on that first part. The fool hath said in his heart. There is no God. It's an age-old perennial question, is it not? Does God exist? What is the meaning of life? In fact, you get the stock replies. Well, if there is a God, I can't see him. Where is he? I can't see God. I've never seen him. Why doesn't he show himself to me? Your problem is... You're weak. You're a weak individual. And you need God like you need a crutch. Ever heard that? That's often what people say about believers. And also, what about suffering? What about suffering in Syria at the moment? It's unsettling, isn't it? People ask, where is God? People can also ask, where is God? Not just in Syria, but also in Stockport. If people are suffering, are they not? Where is God in Stockport? Um, the problem with all of these questions is that, here's the point, and I want you to really think about this. I want you really to stop and think about what I'm about to say here. God is not in the business of revealing himself and forcing you to believe in him. If you have that worldview, if you begin with that premise, forget it. That is not the way God is doing things. He is, let me say it again, he's not in the business of forcing you to believe by some scientific proof showing himself incontrovertibly that he exists. Now why is that? Why isn't God revealing himself as people want him to do, as people expect him to do. Why is it different? Why is it that you need faith? Look at Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That's what God's done. Why has he done that? That they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him. Though he be not far from every one of us. Do you see the difference between God just showing up and saying, here I am, and what this verse is saying, that you have the responsibility sorry, to seek him, exactly, to find him. If happily they might feel after him and find him. Why do you think that would be? Because you want to find him. Because you want to know him. If God just did it all, then we'd all have to believe, wouldn't we? We'd all have to follow him grudgingly because mm, there he is. But the difference is God wants you to seek after him and he's not far off. 
So how has he done that? Has he made it that difficult? Do you feel that God, where are you? Where is he? You know, I can't find him. Is it really so difficult to find the Lord God and to prove to oneself that he exists? Well, we're going to look at some clues that God has left along the way. Some clues. Investigators use clues, do they not? They convict men on the basis of clues. Clues can provide a solid case to send somebody down. <laughs> Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that at some point. Well, has God left clues along the way? He has. And I'm going to begin not with looking out, because that's often what we do. Oh, look at the stars at night. That's what they do, isn't it? Oh, isn't it wonderful? No, I'm going to start with you. You are the reason I believe in God. That's clue number one. Now, why would you say that? Turn with me, please, Psalm 139 and verse 14. Often we look out and we think, where is God looking outwards? What about, for a change, looking at oneself, looking inwards? Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body is an amazing thing, is it not? It's incredible. And when people make throwaway statements like, oh, it all happened by chance, <coughs> as you might, for example, throw a die, that does a terrific disservice to the phenomenal complexity, <coughs> intricacy, the wonder that is the human body. Just for example, in your brain, for a moment, your brain, and you might be surprised to, to, to um, believe this, <laughs> but because uh, some of us do struggle at times with our brain, but you have 200 billion nerve cells in your brain. 200 billion nerve cells, and they are connected to one another via trillions of what are called synapses. Synapses, other connections. Now to put this in scale for you, a researcher has said that those connections in your brain, and there are trillions of them, it's greater than the number of stars in the Milky Way. There's a start. It's also, as one says, it contains, the brain, more switches than all the computers and routers and internet connections on earth. Now that's pretty amazing. It is much faster than the fastest computer they've ever made. The fastest one currently costs something like a hundred billion dollars and it's in a, a place housed in a, 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 a 6,000 square foot building. 6,000 square foot building, this, this supercomputer. But you know what? That supercomputer, with its 6,000 square feet, cannot produce a single thought. True? Can that computer think for itself? No, it can't. You can. You and your billions upon trillions of synapses and nerve cells, you can produce a thought. And just a moment, how is that thought happening? Well, maybe you look through a microscope and you're seeing some chemical reactions. But there is a mystery, is it not? How is it? How is it that thoughts come from mere chemical reactions. Do chemical reactions think for themselves? Is that the way it's happening? 
No, there's some mystery to human nature, is there not? You can't take a test tube and replicate that chemical reaction and expect the test tube to talk back and have a thought. No? But scientists tell us that all there is is the brain. Well, if that's the case, we have a clear philosophical problem. One which many great minds have tried to understand. Where does thought, where does consciousness come from? You don't know, do you? <laughs> you don't know, and I, I, you don't know because if you're dealing with it scientifically, you, 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 you're beginning to think, hang on a minute, yes, it doesn't make sense. Thoughts can't come from chemicals. Well, if they can't come from chemicals, my argument to you today is maybe there is something metaphysical, something immaterial, something very special, unique about humans that has been put there by God. That's just beginning with the brain. And of course, I've never seen your brain, and you've never seen my brain, but I know it exists. Don't I? I know your brain exists, I know my brain exists, my brain exists, but I've never seen them. So, I may not have seen God, but when I look around me, I come to that conclusion. I see signs of intelligence. And then, just briefly, some amazing facts about the heart. The heart, every hour, beats about 4,200 times. That's 2.8 billion times during the average lifespan it will pump around 60 million gallons of blood and in one day it can generate enough muscle power to lift a car 50 foot in the air and that on bread and water because we can survive on bread and water it's pretty amazing isn't it and yet isn't it interesting how the atheist will very quickly dismiss that as, oh, that's a mere chance, come on. May I use the modern vernacular? <coughs> Get real. Okay, so there's number one, you, you are amazing. Number two, uh, what about the universe? You've heard that the universe had a beginning, they call it the Big Bang. And when you think of a Big Bang, you tend to think of explosions don't you you, ex you expect it to be chaotic but the universe the attention to detail is phenomenal without such intricacy there'd be no you there'd be no me and there certainly wouldn't be any universe I want for a moment just to talk about atoms if you look into an atom have you come across or heard of protons and neutrons. Come across those before, protons and neutrons? Okay. Well, they exist in a fine balance, in a fine ratio throughout the universe. And they have to, to maintain the glue, the structure that allows the universe to exist, for galaxies to remain together, and for planets to remain together. Now, here's an interesting fact. Did you know that if the ratio of, of those particles, if the ratio were to change by one part in 100 million, 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 I mean, that's just tiny. I mean, I can't even reproduce that. Even if I did that with a dial, I just can't even do it. It's so tiny. But if I could, the universe would cease to exist. Nothing would hold together. It would all vanish by just that tiny amount. It's <coughs> fine-tuning, is it not? Fine-tuning of the universe, which seems to suggest that it was designed, that somebody 
in the beginning put the pieces together so that they might work and so that life might emerge and so that humankind might thrive. I want you to think also of beauty. The beauty that you can enjoy in life. Hands up if you've ever enjoyed a beautiful sunset. That's quite a few. Oh, somebody had put their hand up. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> okay, we need to get out more. <laughs> so there's a, the beauty of a sunset. Or what about, if you've gone to the countryside as I did, we went uh, some time ago, and there was no light pollution, no traffic lights. Now what's that like? That is incredible, is it not? You can lie back and watch the stars. It puts on a show at night, millions upon millions of stars, incredible. And if you get a chance to see shooting stars as well, you ever seen those shoot across the sky? It's incredible. Now we enjoy that beauty. It isn't necessary, really. It's not as if it's going to help us in terms of survival. But as Thomas Brown said, the, uh, the uh, poet, he said that nature is the art of God. Nature is the art of God. How true that is. You know, when you see a masterpiece, if you've ever been down to Paris, the Louvre, and you've seen uh, Mona Lisa, well, Mona Lisa had a painter. Is that not right? The masterpiece had a master, a painter. If ever you've listened to classical music, if that's your thing, Beethoven's Fifth, yeah? When you're in the room and you listen to Beethoven's Fifth, maybe you've gone to a concert and all the players there before you, it's fantastic. But you're not thinking to yourself, no, this is just, you know, each player. Behind it is the man Beethoven, a genius who produced just incredible work of art, work of music. Painters do painting. Composers do composing. Oh, creators do creation. It follows, doesn't it? Just, just, just for a minute, think of the kind of leaps of illogic that can be made by people who deny the existence of God. Take, for example, you're walking through the forest. It's a beautiful day. Maybe you're out at the, in the Peak District and you walk through the forest and you come to a clearing, a wooded clearing. And you see some remnants of ashes. You see some burned out logs. You see some kind of put together seating of, uh, of maybe larger trees, tree trunks, and you see maybe some empty cans of beer, maybe, <laughs> or Coca Cola, whatever it is, whatever is your preference. <laughs> but you know as well as I do. That as you look down at that mess, you know that somebody has been there. Is that not right? Somebody's been there. Somebody's had a campfire. Somebody's had a drink. Somebody's had a sit down. And it's amazing how an atheist will look down and see that. And, oh, look at that mess. Somebody's left. Look at that. And then they'll look up and they'll see the most incredible view maybe from that area rolling hills and trees and maybe a small cottage off, off in the distance and birds flying and and they'll just look at it and think oh nobody was here nobody did this this happened by no one it's just chance Crisps, somebody's been here. Cans, somebody's been here. Come on. It's amazing, isn't it, the kind of way we can suppress the truth about God. And that's what the Bible says. We're suppressing it. 
because we know deep down there is something we may not know who this is we may not come to know God but deep down we know it there is something there is something and someone so finally the third point the clue and here's a big one I'm going to say that likely a reason why you can believe in God is the person next to you is the person sat next to you how do you mean okay Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so the third clue, we've looked at the universe, we've looked at you, the third clue is the person next to you. Why? Because they're a Christian who, have, who has had an experience. And that experience is described here. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me in me it was referred to in the prayer did you notice of uh, I think it was Carol's prayer about how Jesus dwells in people <coughs> Jesus dwells in people and that is Christianity Christianity is where Christ comes down out of heaven and he takes residence in the person it's a supernatural event it's a miracle and there's just something about that person there's just something different about that individual there's something special about that person and I'm seeing they may not be perfect but I'm seeing something of Christ in them something of that testimony that Jesus is living in them Christianity is Jesus living in the person how by Holy Spirit it's a miracle I can't explain it it's not as if that the person is doing it religiously if as if they've modified their behavior as if they've gone to a book that says how to be like Jesus in 12 easy steps it's not that but Jesus he comes into the person and makes that change miraculously and there, and this is my book bear, as you all know, is the difference between the true Christian and the false Christian. And there are plenty of false Christians around. We're, as Christians here, we're aware of that. They are religious people. They go to church and are all pious. They are self-righteous types. The fire and brimstone types. The vicar who likes tea and scones. I don't care if the vicar likes tea and scones. I don't care. I really do not care, nor, nor should you. We should care about whether Christ is in the vicar. If Christ isn't in him, then you're wasting your time. It's just, that's the way it is. Fake smiles, fake niceness, Sunday best, and so it goes on. That is not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when he came, well, who the who did he attack most of all? He attacked the hypocrites, did he not? He attacked, actually, the vicar types. The types who were lording it over the people. And he said, your serpents, your vipers, your children of the devil. He even called them pigs. He called them that. That's why, pigs. The pigs at the trough. In it for themselves. 
Jesus didn't mince words. He didn't hold back. Because those sorts of people, religious types, will grab you and get you into their little crowd and you'll be part of their club and you'll never know the real Jesus. And I'll tell you what, they'll take you by the hand and lead you down the road, the broad way, as Jesus says, to destruction. Many of those that find that path. Jesus said of the Pharisees, he said they'll go over land and sea. They'll travel far and wide to find a convert, a proselyte. And they'll make that person twice as fit for Gehenna, which is destruction. Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus simply wants you to look for him. That's all he wants. He wants you, by faith, to say, you are Lord. Take me. I want to know you. Because he certainly wants to know you. We know that. He must want it because he died for you. John 3, 16. Let's look at it. John 3, 16. Possibly the most uh, well-read scripture. In the word. But sadly, it's become something of a cliche. It's become a bit hackneyed. A bit kind of, oh, you know, you see it on the side of the church. John 3.16. So let's just look at John 3.16. What is Jesus saying here to you today? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you had that experience? Have you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if not, I think we've looked at some good evidence why to believe. So, believe. John 3, 16. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what it takes. It doesn't take changing your ways it doesn't you come as you are and you simply say lord jesus you are lord you are lord i believe in you i want to change i want to know you and then the heavens open the heavens do they open and god pours into you his spirit and his spirit witnesses, bears witness, chimes, resonates with your spirit. And you say, oh my, God is. <laughs> God is and he lives in me. That is the experience of so many of us. And the experience of thousands and millions of people. Who have come to know the Lord Jesus and before somebody jumps in and says well you're bonkers you you're off your head you're a mental case well if we're mental cases why is it that many of us hold down jobs good jobs we go to work we work in the community we have certain members that uh, hold prominent positions in in office, in politics, in, in different areas of uh, society, many. I mean, look at Roger. Fine, upstanding man, played the piano, had a very good career. I won't. Uh, maybe this is a bit too much. Too much. We don't want to make him swell head, but. We, <laughs> the point being that we're talking about 
an entrance into something that is uniquely different, that is not madness, but that is clearly evident before us. There has to be something beyond, beyond ourselves that made all of this. You sit on a chair, you sit on a chair today, and you trust that the person who made the chair did the design work and it upholds you. Just simply, on, you, on the basis of trust, you sat on that chair this morning and you know the chair works. Every day you breathe in and out on the basis of trust. Every day your cells replicate, your DNA works away on the basis of trust. It's all happening behind the scenes. You couldn't fill the world with books, encyclopedias, explaining all of this that's happening, that's going on, that you take for granted. And yet it continues, and it goes on, and it's inexorable. And you get up in the morning, and on the shoulders of giants, you get up, you have your breakfast, and you go about your day's business, you couldn't do a single thing if it weren't for something, some intelligence that put it there in the first place. So, will you please think about that? Will you please think on not taking life for granted, but looking at yourself, looking at talking to the people next to you, and just think, there's more to this. There's more to life. And I can tell you, I can assure you, that once you know God, once you know the Lord Jesus, there is certainly more to life. There are spiritual realities that will open up to you, and you will be amazed. You will be enthralled. And you'll come to know that life just isn't this material stuff. But there is greatness beyond. God has done amazing things. Just repent and believe. Repent and believe. Well, that's it. We've ended there. Hopefully you now believe that God exists. <laughs> so we'll hand over to... Uh, support.